What's me? going on, folks? How are we doing today? Everyone's rolling in the chat. Why don't you go put it in the chat where you're calling in from? So today, we're actually not going to talk about anything related to go-to-market. I figure we could talk about ice cream today. And so Henry said he eats three pints on every Sunday to get ready, especially if it's earnings week. So Henry, what typically is inside of those three pints of ice cream that you eat? So I, for my entire life, only ate vanilla ice cream. And then one day my daughter, I have a seven-year-old daughter, she ordered, she was ordering strawberry ice cream and I asked her for a lick and it was delicious. This was like two years ago. And I've only eaten strawberry ice cream since then. Only <sighs> strawberry ice cream. Not yeah. like strawberry tress leches, not the no, fancy salt and straw ice. balsamic thing. Just That's right. You ended no, until no, no, no. You're, you had a seven-year-old daughter to try a different flavor other than <laughs> vanilla. It's good. Strawberry <laughs> ice cream is, I'm pretty sure, the best. <laughs> unbelievable amazing oh. i don't know how you're gonna follow that up millie but what's yours oh i'm gonna go really bougie on us i'm gonna say i really love a lavender ice cream oh no, uh, that's not right real there. ice cream that's a flower I nonsense becca Mine bring us home all credibility. <laughs> hey you know this i'm this from the land difficult of <laughs> I feel like I'm bougie too, but not like on the floral side. I like it when there's candy in it. So like the Reese's and the peanut butter and the M&M's and like the cookie, just all of that mixed into just a vanilla base. Great. That's right. <laughs> yes. Well, Nick and I went to McDonald's the other day together and we both got a triple McFlurry. So we are on the same page. And on that note, Becca, I think we can stop yeah. talking about ice cream and bring back the regularly scheduled programming. Let's do it. Great. All right. Yeah, let's do it. So hi, everyone. Um, thanks so much for joining in today. Uh, we're going to be covering off on our presentation from Zero to Hero, Mastering Buyer Signals to Break into Top Tier Accounts. We have Henry Shuck, our very own uh, CEO of Zoom Info, Millie Beetham. Uh, she's our Director of Go-To-Market Strategy at Zoom Info. And we have the brilliant minds behind 30 Minutes President's Club, uh, Nick and Armand on today. We're so thrilled to have everyone here. First, we're going to go over some brief housekeeping, and then we're just going to dive right in with some polls and get into some accounts here. So if you are experiencing any issues viewing today's session, please let us know by using that Q&A chat. We'll try our best to go ahead and address those concerns, but a quick tip is to just refresh whatever browser you are in. That should fix most of the issues there. Also, feel free to use that Q&A box to ask our presenters any of those questions that might pop up along the way today. We have some time at the end for that, so we will get through as many as we possibly can uh, with the time. Uh, we've also dropped some related pieces of content in the resources tab of your ON24 console screen. Um, we particular, I'd like to call out our GTM plays here at Zoom Info. This really is the foundation of today's session. Um, they're open source and available for free, uh, and you can curate your own library, which is the best part. So you don't have to bookmark any of those. Um, we are recording the session. We'll send that out within a couple of days. Um, so if you need to jump early, revisit something, share with a colleague, we've got you covered there. And lastly, I wanted to uh, just put up our Zoom Info Safe Harbor statement. So Zoom Info is a publicly traded company. This presentation may contain forward-looking statements. Any buying decision you make should be based only upon currently available products and offerings. The complete Safe Harbor statement is displayed here for your review. All right, and with that, I wanted to go ahead and get into some introductions here. But Henry, did you want to sort of kick things off? Yeah, just a little bit off. about what you're excited? Yeah, as we kick yeah. things off. I wanted to make sure everybody is thinking about the this uh, thinking about this webinar in the same way that we think about it. And we think every day about sales and go to market efficiency. We think about that because if you can drive a really efficient sales process, a really efficient go to market uh, motion, you run a way better company, you generate more revenue per rep, more revenue per dollar spent. Those dollars can go back into the product and innovation. Those dollars can go back into the company. Um, those products, can, those dollars can go back to shareholders. And so driving go-to-market efficiency is what everybody cares about today. And there are really only four ways you can do that. There are four ways you can drive go-to-market efficiency. So it's not like some big textbook. Number one, you can generate more leads of the same quality at the top of the funnel for the same or lower cost. 
more leads of the same quality at the top of the funnel for more or um, for the same or less cost. The second way you can do it is you can convert more of those leads into customers. So if I generate exactly the same amount of leads at exactly the same cost, but I convert more of them into customers, I drive go-to-market efficiency. The third way you can do it is you can convert the same amount of customers at a higher price. And then the last way you do it is you do it all faster. And so you just drive velocity through the entire motion. Those are the four ways you can drive go-to-market efficiency. So when you're thinking about how do I drive a better sales motion, it's all encompassed in those four things. And we believe, and what we're going to talk about today, is our signals that tell you when a company should be in market for your products and services and how you leverage those signals to get more leads into the top of the funnel, convert more people because they're actually interested in your products and services, do it at a higher ASP because they have a very clear problem they're trying to solve, and do it faster because you know they're in market for your products and services. And so that's what we're going to be focused on today. How do you take a signal and how do you drive revenue out of that signal so that you can drive go-to-market efficiency? Amazing. Yes, we're so excited to jump in here. We wanted to push a uh, poll to the audience here. Uh, we want to know what is your priority with all of the things that Henry just mentioned um, at this point in time with your sales team. Um, so while that's there, uh, I wanted to go ahead and jump in here. Um, so today we have our powerhouse of four. They are all working for Zoom Info. Each of them are going to be playing their own respective roles to showcase how to break into these accounts. Henry is going to be our executive looking at the overarching strategy. We have Armand. He's our VP of sales. He's going to be helping us focus in on that ICP and those targets. We have Millie. She's going to be representing our marketer who's building the demand and interest. And then lastly, our tried and true sales rep, Nick, couldn't do it without these ICs. So let's get started here. So team, our first scenario here is there were 50 unique visits from monday.com. We're, uh, we're still seeing the um, poll. Oh, great. Thank you. All right. There were 50 unique visits from monday.com to the zoominfo.com pricing page yesterday. So they are hot. So team, how are we gonna uh, kick things off here? Henry, let's, let's start with you. So look, this is obviously a great buying signal. You've got a company that's in your total addressable market. They are on your web page. They're on your pricing page and there were 50 unique visits. And so the first thing I'm thinking about as the CEO of the company is, who do I know at monday.com and how do I get introduced there? I want to leverage my relationships to get into that company. If I don't know the person, if I don't know somebody there, then I'm still a very powerful prospector. So if you're in a startup uh, business, your founder, your CEO, they're a very powerful person for you to leverage to reach out to the CEO there, to reach out to the CMO there, to reach out to the, to the uh, chief revenue officer on monday.com and try to broker a conversation with your team. And so that's what I'm thinking about. I'm also trying to wrap my head around why is monday.com on, on our website? Is there something that I can figure out to go have that conversation? And who do we work with that looks like monday.com? Can I go to them and say, hey, we work with Smartsheet and Asana and um, ClickUp and they're all of our customers. I'd love to get time to share with you how they're leveraging Zoom Info. So that's what's going through my mind and how I'm thinking about drafting communication. Armand? So next up in the Fantastic Four. So we got Henry coming over the top. And when I was a VP of sales over at PAVE, we had what was called our T10 accounts. And it was the top 10 accounts in any given territory. And Monday.com would absolutely fall in that type of profile. So they're about 1,800, 2,000 employees, give or take. That's a meaty enough size organization where what I'm going to do is I'm going to call a meeting and it's going to be a Shark Tank meeting. And what we're going to do is we're going to bring Nick in, we're going to bring Million, and we're going to bring in Henry. And we're going to have this account alongside our other T10 accounts. And what we're going to start doing is Nick is going to come prepared with the key people on the account. And then we're just going to match up different levels of the power line. When I think of Zoom Info, right, I think of the prestige of a public company. I want to tip the power dynamic in my favor. So while normally I might reach out to a CRO as a VP of sales, I'm actually going to have Henry as the CEO reach out to the CRO and the CEO as well. And then I'm going to take the parallel pass 
at the VP level. And then Nick is going to be prospecting at the line buyers, for example, ahead of RevOps, while Millie is delivering over the top ads. But I won't spoil their thing. My job is to be the train traffic coordinator and make sure that my reps have a plan that can be shared at the CEO and the marketing team level. And that is effectively carried across all of our target accounts across all territories. So that means Nick, I believe you're next. Boom, beautiful. Armand, I'm so grateful that you as my VP of sales actually called this meeting because I have to use you to actually put that Shark Tank meeting together. It's sort of weird if I go to all our executives, I'm like, hey, everybody get in the room, we're gonna tear down this account. So you're gonna help me with that. But I am actually gonna return the favor for both you and for Henry, because you guys are pretty busy people, and I don't want you to have to sit and think about what am I actually going to write in that email to the person that you're contacting where we're trying to match power. So my responsibility is to take all the heavy lifting from Henry, from Armand, from our other execs who we've determined should be reaching out, and I'm going to ghost write a note for you guys. I'm going to say, all right, what is the problem that I think this customer is dealing with? What would Armand say? And I'm going to do my best. And Armand, my guess is you're probably going to tweak some of the stuff in that note. But if I can save you and Henry all of that cognitive burden of having to write something out, that is a big efficiency gain. And you'll be more willing to help me again and again and again to break into these accounts. So that's what I'm doing in this Shark Tank teardown process. But the reality is, you got something, Henry? You sound as excited there for a second. Part of, this is such an important piece because what often happens nick if you don't do that is that it sits on my desk on like a long list of to do's and priorities and while i really want to be helpful i have to carve out time a good amount of time to sit down think about what do i want to say who do i want to say it to what am i going to pull out and that just makes it so that it might be three days four days five days a week away for me actually taking action when you set me up like that, you put it in my inbox, I look at it really quick, I add some comments and boom, it's out. Boom, so exactly. Henry, I have a question for you on this note. Oftentimes I've seen reps send a wall of text to our CEO and it's all the information that they don't need. Number one, what is the information that you would like to know from Nick, the wonderful SDR? And then number two, what is a proper executive level CEO note? phrased like in other words what would that actual email look like yeah so i i i want to know hey what where are we in the buying cycle like hey we've never talked to them before but we saw that they visited our pricing page 50 times and so we think this is a really great opportunity it's our t1 accounts we don't have any relationships there today and then i want to go and then I, in the message i want it to be some key point of value hey mr cro we wanted to reach out to you. I wanted to reach out to you because we help other companies like blah, blah, blah. We noticed that you guys are working on an initiative around whatever it is, or we noticed that on your webpage, your forms are 10 forms, uh, 10 fields long. And we want to show you how you can make that a one form field and drive conversions on your website. It's that short. Hey, can we set up 15 minutes to have a conversation? So it's one, yeah, why am I here? How do I add value? What's my ask? And that is actually going to inform the other thing that I'm doing as the sales rep. We figured out that our, our site was hit again and again and again with people from this target account, monday.com. And chances are we'll be able to actually figure out who some of those people are. I want to see, I'm going to go to Millie and be like, hey, can you help me figure out who the individual human beings that were on our site are? Because while Henry's going over the top and Armand's going over the top, I'm not just going to sit here on my hands and wait for them to eventually click request a demo. I'm yep. going to figure out who those people are, and I'm going to use this magic device that I recently bought called a telephone, and I'm going to call those people. I'll also email them. Millie's sharing what I'm going to email them. If they don't answer, I'm going to email them. But when they pick up the phone and they go, hello, I'm going to say something like, Dave, I just, this is Nick Sigelski from Zoom Info. I just got a note that you were spending some time on our site and it actually prompted me to call you. You, you mind if I take a sec to share why that prompted me to pick up the phone and call you? Dave's gonna be like, all right, yeah, I was just browsing. And then what I'm gonna do is I'm going to plug in the talk track that you talked about, Henry, where it's, hey, you know, usually when folks from an org like yours are looking at stuff like this, it means that they're dealing with a type of problem like insert problem that this persona typically deals with based on what they look like. 
I'm calling about something that I think can help with that. And we work with Henry, you mentioned Asana, um, Smartsheet. Would you be open to like setting up some time to learn more about this? I'm picking up the phone and calling them and I'm plugging in, hey, this is the problem I suspect you are looking to solve when you are on my site. I'm not just gonna sit and wait for them to come to me. Yeah. And I'm yes. gonna work with Millie to send some emails like this. Millie, do you wanna talk about this piece? Yeah, I was going to say, yeah, something like this, maybe, Nick. And again, of course, you're going to probably tap me, right, for a variety of things. So did Armand. But definitely, like, how are we working together, right, to, to develop some, like, really persona-specific, relevant, you know, emails that you can uh, start to deploy, right? You said, okay, we're going to, you know, we're going to take more of a multi-channel approach, right, sales email. I'm going to have my LinkedIn connect go out. I'm going to see that phone call. But obviously, too, right, it's not just on the sales side. From the marketing side, right, we might want to create an audience at monday.com that we can deliver advertising to specifically, you know, essentially flood monday.com with information about Zoom info, right? And then maybe also on the marketing side, we want to make sure whether it's monday.com or anyone visiting the pricing page on the Zoom info site, Right, we're sending key personas, maybe a marketing nurture. Maybe we start to set up a workflow like this that every single time we see that signal, we're sending through to our marketing automation platform and sending out that marketing nurture. Right, like I can start to think about by watching and learning from both Armand's sort of direction and obviously Nick and I sort of playing together. I can figure out right beyond just the signal today from Monday.com, how are we going to go about capturing the demand ongoing? Yeah, so this is great because you start off with everybody gets in a room, they articulate a strategy. What are they going to do? Who are they going to do it to? What are they going to say? And then what Millie showed us here is how do you take that and then automate it so that the next time one of your top 10 accounts hits your web page, you're not in a position where you have to do it all manually, but a big chunk of this happens in an automated way. When I was at Carta, one of the most... Last thing to add is when I was at Carter, one of the most effective things that we would do is we were prospecting into venture firms and we would find one of these triggers. And oftentimes an SDR would just send whatever template that they're going to send based on this trigger to all 20 people on the account. And folks, figure out the highest propensity to buy triggers on your best accounts and get the full Fantastic Four working for you. So a lot of people think that your website is just a mechanism to capture demo requests, but that is defensive aspects of marketing. The offensive aspect of marketing is one of the best performance marketer I ever worked with is he called himself the meat tenderizer. His job was to tenderize the meat, right? There's this funny movie with Will Smith that's actually not a very good movie, but essentially what he does is he plants the number 27 in 30 different places in someone else's life. They see it on the cab, they see it on the hotel, they see it on the billboard. His room number is number 27. And of course, at the end, he makes a bet with the person that he's trying to trick. And he's like, hey, pick any number on the field, any jersey as all, at all, and I'll guess it. And of course, it's the number 27. So get Monday.com seeing Zoom info everywhere to tenderize the meat so that when Nick sends them an email, it's already a nice, soft filet mignon. And on that note, it's the end of the rant. Awesome. Amazing. Thanks all. That was a great analogy. Let's dive into our second scenario team. So project initiative scoop appears on zoom info stating that workday is in the midst of a large scale master data management and business transformation project. How are you going to approach this signal? Um, Nick, this is going to be kicked over to you first here. Oh, wonderful. Okay, so this is actually sort of similar to the the Monday situation where Monday was on our site already. And so we were like, okay, there's clearly something going on here. But I think we're going to treat this situation fairly similarly, because even though they haven't come to Zoom Info to be like, oh, they think this is an option, they are dealing with a series of problems and they have a series of initiatives that we indeed can help with. So step one, I'm going to my wonderful, good looking boss, Armand, and I'm saying, Armand, I think we need to do another one of these account teardowns. Can we call everybody into the room? Um, because I want us to break into the account using a lot of the same things that we talked about here uh, in, in the last example, right? Um, the other thing that I'm gonna do is, I'm going to start allocating some of my prospecting efforts into this account now. 
And I'm probably not going to be like, yo, I read on the internet that you're doing this thing, but I want to start prospecting all across the board. I'm not just going to reach out to one person. I'm not just going to reach out to two people. I've got a scoop here that tells me customer dealing with a problem has an initiative that I think we can help with. I'm contacting people above the line. I'm contacting people below the line. And one tip that I might recommend for folks is if there are other salespeople, I know Workday has salespeople, I'm going to contact those salespeople because I've found, in my experience, salespeople are often very, very willing to help salespeople. So I might just hit up an AE there and be like, hey, I saw this. I don't know if this is legit or not. Would you mind pointing me in the right direction as to who I might need to get to? Yep. And then Nick is going to pass it off to his half-decent-looking boss, me in this case. <laughs> so, folks, you have to remember, mid-market and SMB-level discovery is oftentimes find problem, solve problem. Find problem, solve problem. Ask discovery questions, unveil the problem that they already know that they have, or reveal the problem that they didn't know that they had, et cetera, solve the problem, right? When you get to the level of business transformation when you're selling enterprise at Workday, you don't win deals by just attaching yourself to a problem and asking basic discovery questions. So I actually learned this in Henry's podcast interview where one of the best things you can do is we're gonna run that same motion, right? Top to top, middle to middle, bottom to bottom. And I'm gonna get Henry to go meet with the highest level person that we need to meet with at Workday. But then my job as the VP of sales is to pull in other resources across the organization that mm -hmm. I know can help. And so what Henry's able to do is Henry's not just going to go in and ask three questions, but Henry has seen this happen seven other times at other massive enterprise organizations. And so he's going to come in with a point of view on how other customers have struggled or managed this change. And then what we're going to do is now that we've given them Henry as a resource, we're going to load Henry up with some other resources of our own. Namely, number one, I'm going to find a list of our top enterprise customers that have gone through this exact same thing who are referenceable. So Henry knows he has three names he can drop and offer those as value-add resources to the prospect early on in their transformation so we get on the off on the foot of being an advisor and then number two we're going to offer the right internal resources as well so if they're going through an extremely intense digital transformation they might really really care that they have really strong solutions engineering support on day one and i may choose to work with our head of se and say hey henry this is how we'll typically work with a high level person to give them faith that we're involved early in the process here are both the external and the internal resources that you can use to go effectively do discovery with the cro cio whoever it might be and i think that brings yeah. us over to millie yeah i was gonna say i've really got two things that i need to, to make sure i do right one is i need to go to my best rep which is nick right and i need to go learn what he's saying from these initial conversations he's gone out made these communications happen to a cross a cross work day and i want to know what he's learned so far and so let me take all of that information in right and i'm starting to think about how our messaging might be evolving not just to work day but thinking about as we're tackling right mdm and business transformation at large from from a challenge perspective and then the other thing is that again with uh like what Armand said you have maybe you know 12 month uh 12 months ahead of you in this cycle this sales cycle um, but say we're starting to see little wins, right? We've gotten some meeting conversions, right? In one department or another department, right? With a few heads, maybe a, maybe one of the C-suite. Like I'm starting to see that we're seeing maybe higher than average rent, win rates. And Armand and I are kind of going back and forth. This feels like a signal that is potentially here to stay. It's not just a one-off. It's something that we should be thinking about architecting, you know, content and strategy behind the scenes. So I take that back to my team and I start to say on the, on the marketing side, well, what are we doing to cover our bases here on these topics, right? Do we have the right case studies in place? Do I have content that speaks to both the influencer and the decision maker? Is it top to bottom of the funnel, right? And I can start to put my plan in place around building an integrated marketing, you know, um, initiative to to make sure that we take down Workday for sure and continue to support Nick and Armand as we go through the sales cycle. But also, right, forever forward again, and similar to how we talked about it with Monday.com, every single time a signal of this flavor comes up, we have the the content strategy on hand to make sure that. Uh, 
uh, we can we can capitalize on it. I mean, one thing that's related to that that is my responsibility as the AE in this scenario is Henry might be talking to people at this account. Armand might be talking to people at this account. Our head of solutions engineering might be talking to people at this account. And when we have those conversations, we're going to be learning about things that matter to this customer. And what I'm never going to do with a big enterprise deal like this is just throw like a normal Zoom Info case study over the fence and hope that it hits home. Uh -huh. What I'm actually going to do is I'm going to sit down probably with your team, Millie, and we're going to come up with some custom content that directly speaks to the problems and initiatives this customer is looking at. And when they get a nice, fancy, branded Zoom Info case study that is written for them, they're going through this thing and they're saying, holy cow, like this is tailor made to help us out. This isn't me sending a custom branded proposal. This is me sharing content that is informed by what matters to the customer. And not enough salespeople do this. I think they see their marketing team is like, all right, you set up the website, you send me some leads every now and then. But if you've got an enterprise elephant that you're trying to take down, this is a really, really great play that you can use to make them feel like, all right, our business matters to them. And then just the last thing while I hand it over to you, Henry, my other responsibility that I think will inform what you say is I need to keep you informed and I need to keep Armand informed and I need to keep our executives informed about those things that matter. Because there are going to be times in this long sales cycle, Henry, that you're sitting down with them and I want you briefed every time on, hey, here's the, here's the status of the project. Here's what matters to them. Here's the role that I need you to play the next time you sit down with them. So that's what I'm briefing you on throughout the entire evaluation. What else yep. do you want to add? So two things. I'll add two things. On that note specifically, what I'll say is oftentimes what I ask going into one of these meetings from my sales reps is, what do you want me to get for you? What, and they'll say, oh, and the, they oftentimes don't have the answer to that. They think like I walk in with a magic wand and I just like sprinkle deal dust on the deal and it magically happens. But that question, what do you want me to, what do you want me to get? What do you want me to ask? for what is the get that you want from this meeting and so if you don't know the answers to that i really shouldn't be going in for you like i'm not the ae like how do you want to leverage me in this conversation and so oftentimes it'd be like hey we really like a meeting with this other person down in the chain we haven't been able to get a hold of them we really want you to see if they actually care about this other initiative that we're you know we're really leaning into before we go and pitch that really hard and so know what you want your CEO to get for you and provide that for them because I want to know like what, what exactly do you want me to get? And then the second thing I would say is when you go into an account like this, oftentimes if I show up in here to Armand's point earlier, I'm actually going to be much more likely to say, hey, I have the, a team of amazing solutions consultants. I want to bring our chief data officer and our chief product officer to the next call. I have a guy who builds all of our product integrations. And I know Workday, you're going to need to connect your, your master data management system to your CRM and to your ERP and to all of these different things. Let me bring our chief data officer, our product integration VP, and one of our best solutions consultants to the next call. And we can just talk about what you're trying to achieve and they're gonna have a really unique perspective to provide. And so my game there is how do I give you a whole bunch of value that obviously in that process, we expect to capture as by being one of your partners as you go forward. But in the lead up at a big enterprise company, I'm just giving you resources. I wanna give you my best, smartest resources that, that can help you figure out the solution to this problem. And I expect we're gonna be a part of it because we're gonna be solving that together. Amazing, yeah. I love the takeaway there for me is you don't have to go at this alone, um, but just be really tactical about um, what what's needed and what's required from both ends there. Um, so Millie, were you gonna um, share anything on that or should we pop over into our third scenario here? Yeah, let's get into our third scenario, Becca. Becca, right. can I share one one point that you made about the not having to go at it alone piece? Yeah, absolutely. I'm going to. Okay. Um, so I think this is one of the things that got me excited. I'm going to plug the, the Zoom Info plays here for a second because I think one of the things that 
slows organizations down sometimes is they get a signal like this or they get, oh, there's a, there's a, a project going on at Workday and they're starting from scratch every single time, figuring out, oh, like what's the right path? What should we be doing? And you shouldn't be doing that. You should be sitting down with your team one time and doing what we're doing here today, saying, okay, cool. What are the unique things that the VP of sales, that the CEO, that our head of marketing, that the sales rep can do? And we're identifying plays that we can lean on again and again and again. And so when we get a signal, when we get an event like this, instead of me scratching my head and being, oh, well, let me go to Henry and ask him to write a note. And Henry's like, wait, what? What are you asking me to do? We've identified as a team, hey, these are the common plays that we use to win deals, to break into accounts, to manage competitive battles. And our team is aligned that these are things that we do and we all know the role that we have to play. And so my big recommendation and why I'm excited about these human football plays is that you are coming up with the team, your, your team is coming up with these things in advance and there's never any confusion. So with that, why don't you take us to the next one, Becca? Mm -hmm. Great. No, I love that. Um, yes. So here's our third scenario, everyone. Um, DocuSign has hired a new chief information officer who used to work at a company that used and championed ZoomInfo. So uh, Henry, I'm going to kick this one over to you first. So this one for me, I look, someone post that they got a new job opening or they got a new job on LinkedIn and everybody's like, congratulations, congratulations, congratulations. When they're an advocate of ours, they were an advocate of ours before, a champion of ours before, I am absolutely sending a bottle of champagne and a handwritten note that says, congratulations on the new gig. I hope that you take a moment to appreciate like the success that you've created. Um, that's it, no ask, no nothing. Just like, congratulations, that's it. Um, you would be amazed at how few times this actually happens. And if you could do it like day of, that's a big deal too. I was on a call a few months ago with a guy who got promoted to CEO of a Fortune 100 company. And I used uh, Drizzly. I sent him a bottle of champagne and I wrote a nice note, congratulations. And he wrote me back that day and was like, nobody else did this. You're the only person who did this. Everyone's stuck in the rat race and like getting a bottle of champagne that says congratulations when you get that promotion or you get to that new company is really valuable to do. And so that's where I'm playing here. Um, and that's where I'm playing here. Nice. All right. And then it gets passed over to me. And Henry actually took the thing that I was going to ask him to do. So, sure. folks, if you're a sales leader on this call, your job is to see across the organization and pull resources and get things out of the way from your reps so that they can go sell deals more effectively. And very early on, I was one of the first reps at a company called Pave. And I remember I would sell a deal, the customer would leave because it was the great resignation and all that nonsense. And that same customer would pop up in my demo request feed and I would sell the deal again. So I had sold the customer twice and was giving them the golden experience. I was asking our CEO, Matt, to send the bottle of champagne or the bottle of wine because we were such a small team. Then we got to 200 employees. And I see a rep jumping on a call with a deal that I sold two years ago. And I'm like, hey, do you want to know a thing or two about this champion? They're like, that would be great. And I'm like, guys, train your team to do deal forensics. Anytime you see a customer come back, follow the yellow brick road and figure out where they came from and go figure out how each of the people who've touched that customer in the past can play a role again, because you don't want to start on chapter one. You want to start on chapter 10. And so what this actually looks like is I'm the sales rep. I'm looking at deal forensics. I want to know the rep that first sold the deal. And I want to know the quirks that came with that sales cycle. Maybe they can't get the power. Maybe they have good internal capital. Maybe they have bad internal capital. That's number one. Next, I want to know the CSM on that deal. And I want to know everything that happened with that account, the good, the bad, the ugly, how they specifically like to use Zoom Info. And then number three is I want to tap our head of customer success to show that early support for the customer. And I want to pull one of those people on to the next discovery call because if Nick didn't sell that first deal, we're starting on chapter one. That first discovery call needs to start on chapter 10. And it's a, hey, 50%, thank you so much for coming back. 
50%, help us out. Let's get on the same side of the table. What's different about this situation than your last job? So you're not starting on chapter one. Boom, beautiful. Um, I want to plus one, one thing that Henry said, and Armand, you talked about the champagne also, and uh, a philosophy that I have, a belief that I have about sales is you can't be perceived to be better until you are first perceived to be different. And when you change jobs and get 822 congratulations LinkedIn messages, you're not being different. Do things that stand out. My my uh, my litmus test is anytime I'm, um, I encounter a situation in sales where I don't know what to do, I usually think, what would your run-of-the-mill average normal salesperson do in this scenario? And then I just do the opposite because the bar is not set tremendously high. So um, in this scenario, yep, I'm going to be trained by my wonderful, wonderful VP, and I'm going to do those forensics on this person that I'm meeting with but I'm also going to do those same forensics on the new account that they are at. And so this um, new CIO, has, they, they used to um, work at a company that used us, and now they're at DocuSign. Okay, have we ever talked to DocuSign before? Who have we talked to? What have they said? Why aren't they a customer yet? If they are, what modules and things are they using and what should they be using? I need to know both the forensics on this person from the old account, but also the new account. And so usually when I'm thinking about breaking into an account, I think about the past, I think about the present, and I think about the future. The past is just the forensic stuff that you talked about there, Armand, both at the old company and at the new company. I want to know any history that exists there. Who have we talked to? What's going on? What's the engagement been? The present is what is going on at DocuSign now that would make this person who used to use us want to use us again. I need to understand the conditions that are going on today that would make them say, I need this thing today. Because if I just reach out to them and say, hey, I got some champagne you want to buy again, I mean, I guess that might occasionally work, but I can go one step further and make it really easy for them to say, oh, yeah, that's right, I did use this. Oh, that's right, this is a problem we're dealing with today. Great, let's buy. So I'm thinking about the present conditions. I'm also thinking about the future. And this is where, again, I'm going to lead on my executives because I'm not, as a salesperson, thinking all day, every day about what's the future of a company like DocuSign and digital transformation. I'm probably going to listen to someone much, much smarter than me, Henry, probably you, because my guess is you have a very clear sense of where this stuff is going. Or my sales leader has a very clear sense of, hey, this is transformation that's going on in these spaces. You should be prepared to address that with the customer. And so now when I reach out to this person that's changed jobs and I actually get on with them, I know all of their quirks, history, et cetera, because I did the forensics, but I'm also able to say, hey, here are some reasons today and tomorrow that you might want to become a customer again. Millie, what do you have to add? Yeah, um, so follow my logic here a little bit. I, I'm gonna also say, p pretend in this scenario, maybe the person who actually owns the DocuSign account is actually an account manager, maybe mm -hmm. versus a rep. Let's talk about that quickly. So in that scenario, right, that account manager might be sort of a higher level strategic rep, and maybe they only have a few accounts. And so those really high touch, high touch experiences that y'all were just talking about, absolutely a number one priority. However, what if we then said, okay, maybe it wasn't DocuSign, but the chief something officer, right, who used to work at a company that's you know champion Zoom info. What what happens if that person's at uh, an SMB and that AM has two hundred accounts, right? I'm thinking about maybe all the places beyond just this scenario where like we might need to shore up holes in our go-to-market strategy. And with this being, as you all like have mentioned, this is such a valuable signal. There's so much history and there's so much possibility to use that connection to move in and make that sale. Um, but what I want to th think about is, right, if, if we can go ahead and think about potentially automating this, right, like I said before, if we're automating this, and, and putting this on rails, right, that any time that there is a new hire, some of that congratulatory message, maybe it doesn't come with the gift, but at least we're getting that congratulations, like Henry said, without any ask, right, is going out and hitting that person's inbox, then maybe we're the only person who at least even said congratulations to the hundreds or 200s or thousands of people, right, who changed jobs that week or that month. 
And so I want to make sure, right, as a marketer, I'm thinking about how can I set this up as in an automated way so this play can continue to run behind the scenes for the places where we're not able to maybe go that extra mile because it doesn't pencil or we don't have the resources to do it. Yeah. And on this one, forget about chief information officer. What you want to be able to do here is any user of your platform who is a good user or any user at all in the past doesn't have to be somebody who actually bought your service or who was the chief level officer. If somebody who used Zoom Info leaves and goes to another company, I want to be in front of them. I want to do that in an automated way. We have half a million users. I want to make sure that I'm staying on top of that all the time. And so leveraging, uh, leveraging technology to let you do that at scale is super important. And like just the plug here that Millie showed, you can upload all of your users, all of your champions into Zoom Info. We can automate the downstream motion there. Even if the minimal piece is, just tell me that it happened. Maybe I don't want the email to go out, but I want to know every time one of my users, one of my champions changes jobs. That's an incredibly valuable signal um, and piece of intent. Yeah, absolutely. Um, thanks all for that. I think my hugest takeaway from what you guys were talking about, Henry, I like what you said about this like really personalized touch because I think with this the COVID and the pandemic, things shifted to digital so quickly that a lot of teams lost touch with that side of their uh, outreach there. So I loved that example about um, sending that when they switched jobs there. Um, okay, team, we have time for just one last scenario here. So let's go ahead and dive in and close things out. Um, companies across manufacturing, finance, software, and transportation industries, so lots of widespread industries here, have spiked on the terms sales leads and sales automation within the last two weeks. So Armand, how are we, how are we gonna start uh, outreach here to accommodate this signal? So there are only two times in my life that I have seen someone salivate so intensely. Time number one, pint of strawberry ice cream in front of Henry Shuck. Time number two, more territory and trends in front of a VP of sales. So when I was at Carta, all of a sudden, all of these biotech companies started requesting demos. Lo and behold, biotech companies started to get a ton of funding, and they were also starting to do really complex valuations, which is something that Carta helped with. And so what did we do? I'm actually a two-time Zoom Info champ as a customer. First thing we did is we said, OK, your job as a revenue leader is to identify trends that allow you to carve your territories more effectively or expand your territories. We're like, OK, we historically only went after traditional venture back tech. I want to pull a targeted industry list from Zoom Info, and I'm going to pipe in the ICP biotech companies that I believe we should prospect into. And the way this test begins is with enriching the territories and carving out some of these territories for test campaigns with our SDRs. And Millie's going to talk more about how we start to bring in marketing on this stuff, but they're also warming up these leads because we don't know the right people to capture as part of this trend. So we're having the SDRs lead the pack Right? And they're doing all this targeted outreach on these biotech companies. And we're having these AEs take these calls. And along the way, what makes this scenario different is this is not one company, this is a trend. What I need to do is I need to start prodding my team for what's making these manufacturing companies different from these software companies. And by doing these targeted list uploads and these targeted campaigns, I can now start to run bulk tests on these different industry customers to try to figure out what's going on with these trends. Eventually where this goes is you start to see that biotech companies are different from other types of companies or manufacturing companies are different from other types of companies. So now we're pulling on PMM and asking them for resources, case studies, enablement materials so that we can sell effectively to these people. And now I'm enabling five sellers across. And if we find that they're really different, now what we're doing is we're starting to call, carve industry-based territories, but that's if and only if the sales cycle is materially different, faster, larger, more complex, more jargon than the rest. But again, it all starts with finding this trigger in the first place and then running what was step one in my Zoom Info play back in the day before I think it was called Zoom Info plays, which is getting that list in there and running campaigns from marketing to SDR to sales. Yeah. 100%. And the way I read this and I think about it is um, these are, this is much more of a big net that you're catching. 
You've got all of these companies from all of these different industries spiking on topics that we know when they're researching is relevant to us. It would be like in your Carta example, if a biotech company was researching complex valuations or uh, fundraising or venture capital, if you saw that, you would want to go after them. For us, if we saw sales automation and sales leads, we know that they're researching topics that are relevant to problems that we solve for them. And so what I would do here is, to Armand's point, manufacturing companies think about this differently than finance companies think about these this differently than software companies think about this differently than transportation companies. And so I would take this and I would say, listen, when a manufacturing company spikes on intent, what do I want to have happen? What I want to have happen is, to Armand's point, I want an email to go out to the buying committee at that company. That's just an initial touch. I want the sales rep on the account to know that that email went out and I want to get them into a sequence that says this email went out on your behalf tomorrow you know, in a couple hours, you need to call tomorrow and this other email goes out tomorrow. This other email goes out. Um, you need to call them again and you have that buying committee. Those emails are going out. The sales reps has the phone number to call against those. And then in each of these different uh, verticals, you have a different message. You have different case studies that you talk about in your sequence. You have different problems that you solve for them. You talk differently to a manufacturing company than a software company. And so to set up an automated motion here, what you want to start thinking about is how does my message differ, differ from industry to industry and potentially even from buying committee level. So do I want to send the same thing to a VP? as a director, as a manager. Maybe VP and director have one set of communication and managers have a different one. And so I set up that infrastructure basically so that when the next spike comes in, I can plug right into that infrastructure. Boom, beautiful. Um, a lot of what Armand talked about is going to impact what I do. As an individual rep, however, I think the one thing that I, I want to understand that I didn't hear from either of you is like, What's actually going on that is prompting these spikes in the first place? Armand, in your Carta example, it sounds like there must have been some sort of investment going on in this biotech space. And so even though it might not be directly applicable to how I'm going to pitch and position my thing, I need to understand what the impetus is for this change in this space, because that's going to inform a lot of the conversations that I have. So one, I think as a rep, I need to educate myself on what is prompting this in the first place. Two, I'm getting this information about the spikes of what folks are searching for. And when folks go on the internet and search for stuff, they usually search out for solutions. If I have really bad breath, I'm going to go on Google and I'm going to type in mouthwash delivery. and I'm not Googling what to do if I have bad breath. I have a picture of the solution in my head already, and I Googled mouthwash. Well, Henry, if I work for a company that sells toothbrushes, that's still a good lead for me, even though they're Googling a different solution. And so what I need to do as a rep is I need to figure out what are they searching for and what is the real problem that they are looking to solve? So if someone is searching, uh, I think it was sales leads and sales automation in this scenario, I should be thinking backwards and saying, okay, if I'm a human being that Googles that, what's the real problem that they're looking to solve? Because I need to be prepared for when I call that person with bad breath, they're gonna say, oh, you know what? I just ordered some mouthwash, I'm all set. And I need to be able to teach them, hey, there's actually a root cause going in on here. You might want to try a toothbrush. Want to check out a demo at your friendly neighborhood dentist office? Um, the last thing that I'm going to do is I'm going to take a look at my prospecting mix, the outbound efforts that I'm doing as a whole. And I'm likely going to reallocate some of my efforts towards this space because um, the way that I think about my prospecting is I've got some like hot, hot intent spike on the website, et cetera, folks that I'm outbounding. Cool, I need to keep going after those. And then I've just got like all of the companies in my territory that like, yeah, I could call this one, I could call this one, I call this one. I'm gonna take like the run of the mill ones and I'm gonna do a little bit less of those and a little more of the, hey, this, this industry is having a spike. Let me more aggressively pursue that for a month and see what the yield is there. But then what I'm also gonna do to make my job easier is I'm gonna make Millie go warm some of these folks up. How are we going to do that, Millie? Yeah, yeah. I was just going to say, Nick, uh, what you just described is is that prioritization, right, of your time. And I think it's so 
interesting because if I'm I, if I'm in this marketing position, um, I don't necessarily want, but I could right. I'm I'm about to potentially reallocate reallocate some advertising dollars right to these to these specific industries. But I don't want to do that if I haven't then aligned with. Armand all the way down to the reps to say y'all are going to go after right these industries and you're ready to prioritize them over you know the following weeks um but the absolute number one thing that i need to do to make sure um that you have something to catch is to understand that these spikes are happening and, and make sure that there is that air cover there is that advertising that's going out and starting to capitalize on these intense signals to to henry's point how can right then the content right in the everything from the ad copy to the landing page to the content behind maybe a gated form or such right all of that content needs to be relevant to the industry it needs to be relevant to the persona persona's level right in this case the sales persona i i have to make sure i have all of that lined up because again right i i could reallocate budget and start you know creating these audiences and delivering these ads but then if they're not super specific and relevant, right, maybe that's just wasted ad spend in that case. We don't want that to happen. I want to have this orchestrated effort. Um, and uh, I think the, the other thing I wanted to note was around, um, Nick, you called out something that I like to call multi-part intent. And apologies, Henry, I don't think that's a Zoom info term. I think that's just a Millie term. Um, but I think about it as there's sort of multi-part intent, right? Nick, you're talking about, okay, great. I know that they're spiking on these intent topics, but now I might go in and see if there's a new signal. Maybe there's something like a scoop, like we talked about around, you know, business transformation at some, in some of these in some of these places. Um, maybe then I'm also going to check, right, that. Uh, the person, the 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 person I'm trying to reach out to at that account who would fit my buying committee, you know, see what their you know previous relationship to Zoom Info was, right? And you start to layer these things, and so it's almost beautiful that we're talking about this scenario at, at, as the last one. I don't necessarily thought we were going to get here, but the, it's almost like all the different signals that we've talked about layer into how you know Nick might approach or think about reprioritizing this time. Um, around this scenario um, when it comes up. And I don't actually think um, we did that on purpose. I think it just happened naturally that way. So we'll chalk that up to a win today, folks. <laughs> yeah, you guys are naturals. Um, I was going to say, I, I love the standpoint of the air cover because I'm not a salesperson, but I work in marketing. And I think there's this still this disconnect at orgs all across the world. It's just, OK, it's all on sales now. Like, our job's done. We got, we got them in the door with the display budget or whatever the channel was. Um, but I love the air cover part because it does continue that engagement across channels to Armand's example earlier with the 27 thing, it continues that um, till the deal closes. So really, really uh, love all the perspectives that you guys have shared today. Um, we're gonna go ahead and dive into a little bit of Q and A here. We did get a couple great questions and some that I've seen actually pop up in multiple sessions that we've run or others that I've attended myself. Um, so I will leave this open to the floor here. Uh, Bennett asked, how do you feel as a prospect receiving an email saying, we know you've checked our site. I've had prospect be prospects become turned off when we have that type of data or mention that we do. Uh, curious what the right messaging um, in those scenarios might be. Well, I think if I send somebody an email and I say, I know you checked out my site, that's like a little too smack them in the face, like direct on the nose. Like anytime I get a signal that somebody is on my site, researching stuff, looking for something, I usually want to say, hey, I, I heard that you were, or I got a note that you were investigating some of this stuff. That's great. Right, I'm not saying heard you were on our site. Like I'm a, li I'm sort of being a little indirect about it. The other thing that I'm doing is again, I'm coming and saying usually when someone is interested in stuff like this, that means they're looking to solve a problem that looks like this. I'm again, I'm going to the problem that I think they're looking to solve. So that's one is like you can soften your messaging a little bit. The other thing to acknowledge is you can send somebody a bottle of champagne. You could send them a champagne brewery or distillery. I don't know how they make champagne. You are still always going to have prospects that are turned off no matter what your outreach is. 
And so accept the fact that like success in sales is determined by the number of uncomfortable conversations that you're willing to go seek out and have. And when you prospect, you're going to have people react negatively. And the people who were turned off by your message probably weren't turned off by the fact that you knew they were on your site. They just don't like getting sales outreach in general, or they're a grumpy person. Don't let that deter you. Pick up the phone and call the next person. Move on to the next person. That's my rec. Per I, I, I don't even, that's perfect. Thanks so much. Uh, if you guys are game for this quick question, Henry, to close things out, I think this would be a great one for you to uh, sort of touch on here. But uh, Josh asks, sometimes our AEs use buyer intent to help reach out and then get disappointed when they feel like it didn't work. Do you have any thoughts on that? Yeah, look, uh, none of these strategies work 100% of the time. That is just not what any of us signed up to be in business for. Like most of our strategies, if we're like really crushing it, are going to work like 15 to 20% of the time. And that's amazing. And so you have to be prepared for a lot of work that you do not being exactly the right time or the right person or it got through to them at the exact right moment that they were interested in. Persistence matters here, right? Like just because the first outreach didn't work doesn't mean the sixth one is not too. So a lot of times people give up a little bit too early in the process and they go, okay, buyer intent didn't work. So what buying intent does for sure, no question about it, is if I give you 100 accounts that show buying intent for your product and service, and I give you 100 accounts that don't, the 100 accounts that I gave you that are showing buying intent for your product and service are gonna convert at a much higher rate than the accounts that don't. No question about that. They will not convert at 100%. And so your job is to use your resources, your time, your energy, your thoughts, um, on the things that are most likely to convert. And so using buying intent is the way to make sure that your effort is matched with the best outcome mm -hmm. um, possible. And so use intent to prioritize. It's not a DocuSign waiting for a signature. Absolutely. Well, um, that is all the time we have today. Um, I wanted to first and foremost thank all of our awesome uh, presenters, Henry, Millie, Nick, and Armand uh, for jumping on today. Lots of great uh, tactical takeaways for our audience. Uh, again, if you are looking to learn more about the plays that were covered in today's session, visit that GTM plays link in the chat. We'll also send that up as a follow-up note with the recording, which will be available within two days of today. Uh, we definitely highly encourage you to go uh, send that out to your colleagues who might get some uh, great uh, tactics to incorporate as you guys kind of move this GTM motion forward. We thank everyone for their engagement today, and we kindly ask that you actually provide some feedback in a survey that's going to pop up here in a sec as we close things out. But until the next time, thanks so much. Thanks, everybody. Thank you, Nick. Thanks, Armand. Thanks, Millie. Great stuff to you. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, everybody. Thank you, Becca. Thanks.